First of all, thanks to our sponsors, the School of uh, Computing and Mathematical Sciences here at University of Waikato for sponsoring the room and the New Zealand Open Source Society for sponsoring the big blue button instance which we are using for running this online instance on I'm just turn that full screen. Tonight I'm going to talk about Docker, um, basically what it can do and why you basically would want to use it. I came across Docker two, three years ago, um, mainly due to the deep learning work that I've been involved here at the University of Waikato and all the commercial work that we're doing with it. And Docker has basically become an absolute must for me. Otherwise, it's impossible to do actually the work, or it would be extremely difficult and painstakingly slow, to be honest. But you might see why that's the case a bit further down the track. There's a little bit of a history first. Um, so Docker is a, an operating system level virtualization. It's not hardware virtualization, which has been around since the 60s. Um, so with on an on the operating system level virtualization, that's sort of like more of a lightweight approach. You don't emulate hardware. You basically just run on the same hardware and do something with it. And in terms of Linux, um, having sort of like um, been around for a while with Linux, so change root or the CH root has been around on various Unixes uh, for quite a long time. And then of course made its way onto Linux as well, which in 1982 is quite a long time, 40 years now. So it has a nice round anniversary this year um, that basically just changes the apparent root directory um, for, uh, for instance, for testing deployments of software compilations and things. Uh, you might, when you're compiling software, you might not actually um, compile it into your current system, even if it's only user local, because you might actually have a production version there and you don't want to ruin that with a development version if that has all kinds of bugs and especially if it's a multi-user system that can wreak a little bit of havoc there. So that helps with that, but it has a whole host of um, limitations. So you can find all these things are linked basically to the various uh, Wikipedia articles so you can uh, read up in your spare time if you feel like it. Um, so some of them with the stacking of various sort of like um, virtualization, some might have a problem with that. Sometimes people can sort of like break out of this particular uh, jail with a second CH root, which then they're once again, uh, probably super user on your system, which is not particularly great. Um, later on 2001 Linux V server, um, which basically uses um, security context, which the kernel itself provides. It's a bit of a jail mechanism in there as well. And that's apparently what's uh, used for virtual private servers. So anyone who is um, using their own VPSs in whatever data centers, they will most likely actually run in a jail that's running on a bigger machine there. So you can actually run your systems there. That's what, that was actually news to me today when I was reading that. Um, and there's Linux containers, which is in 2008. Uh, with the development that started then, and that uses the kernel's um, C groups and namespaces isolations mainly to provide um, like isolation of uh, applications and things like that. And then a bit further down the track, uh, Docker in 2013, that's the one I'm concentrating on today, that uses its own lib container library, but also lib virtualization, LXC, um, Linux containers, and systemd and spawn sort of like for doing virtualization. And the nice thing about Docker is that all the containers are basically just standard processes. I'm not sure about Linux containers. Lawrence, are they also just standard processes? And just because libvirt is for talking to virtual machines. Yeah. So I think the way it looks is that you create one virtual machine, or there might be, I was looking at some, some cross-platform thing, what was it called, Rapture or something like that? And that claimed to run on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Okay. And uh, on, but, but of course on Windows, it all it was all Linux containers. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, so, uh, 
I thought the whole point of Docker was it built on containers, but it could be that those containers run within a virtual machine just to keep it isolated from your main mm. host device completely. You know, it might it might use both. And also, I do know that when Docker first came out, it was so such a big thing. Even Microsoft tried to do Docker on Windows. Yeah, and you can still have basically images. Um, so even though, so we'll get to there, you can actually see the images sort of like in the usual place where you find your Docker images, they actually then go to Microsoft and you load those there. But the interesting thing is sort of like, if you look at Alpine Linux uh, Docker images, they start at five megabytes, which is probably just busy box with just the kernel and not much else. You don't need a kernel in that, the whole point is containers running. Yeah, well, yeah, sort of, it's just really just some little bits and pieces that to run things. And then if you look at um, the smallest Windows server, is I think 4.5 gigabytes Gigabyte. as an image versus uh, five megabytes is like three orders of magnitude large. Also, <laughs> Even if you're running that on Windows. So does it include a Windows kernel? It's everything. <laughs> it's like, so it's not exactly lightweight. And I think at the end of the day, you might just, well, Use virtualization, hardware virtualization, because I don't think so. There's much difference. I do know. I do know. Microsoft has actually given up uh, recommending Docker on Windows. Yes, it's sort of like there was a bit of a hype for 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 some years, but that sort of like faded again. But they're still sort of like offering it and whatnot. But I mean, you always have the problem with the licensing and all that. So, I mean, why would you want to go down there? Even Microsoft is saying, "Don't use this for new stuff." Yeah, it's legacy. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so that's basically for, for a little bit of a history. I mean, things have changed a bit, and especially if the kernel supplies things, then it's a bit more guaranteed that this is really separate rather than things that get tacked on at uh, sort of like outside just to get certain things done, but times change, so. There was another one, I don't know what they got, user mode, user mode Linux. It's a Linux. It's the guts of a Linux kernel running as a usable process. Really? Emulate, yeah. Oh my. It's okay. Very old. It's so you know, yeah. e-server is probably for that kind of era. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so interesting. Right. Yeah, but I mean, Linux vServer still seems to be around, and I mean, it's also twenty years now. I thought PPS is more all you know based on proper virtualization. Not necessarily, but. Um, so what I was reading sort of like, it, it is, oh, you can use it basically for virtual private service like that. So you have, especially if you just um, run, it might be more lightweight than proper virtualization. So you can run a whole lot more on your Linux box, especially if you're providing Linux VPSs rather than install whatever onto it. So um, that might help with that. Yes. Oh, on to the next slide. So maybe David can see that too. Um, so in terms of what parts make up Docker, so you basically have the software, the objects, and the registry. So as in terms of software, um, Docker is written sort of like as a client-server architecture. So you have Docker D, which is the daemon. Um, that basically manages all your containers and things. And then you have, for instance, a command line interface for Docker D, which is the Docker command line um, executable, which you can then supply subcommands for, for managing images, containers, uh, cleaning up, and all kinds of things, building images and stuff like that. Uh, in terms of objects, you basically have um, three different things. The first one is the image. That's basically your template for uh, sort of like for instantiating containers. So it's read only, so you can't do anything with it. You can then do stuff with containers. So that's actually an instantiation or an active environment of an image. And that allows you to run applications then. Uh, and with a service, um, that's normally not used for a mere mortal like me. Um, we actually trying to scale across multiple Docker daemons. So if you have swarms, basically, for really hyperscale and whatnot. So I'm not quite sure how Kubernetes actually fits in there because Docker also at some stage um, developed their Docker Swarm, which I think fits sort of like into that thing. Uh, but Kubernetes, which is also, I think, agnostic of Docker, but is probably mainly used in conjunction with Docker, um, is basically used then for um, scaling things up. 
And last but not least, the registries. That's basically um, nothing else than a repository for your images where you can either retrieve an image via pull or deploy a new image via a push command. And these registries can either be public or private. As you. And um, so the Docker Hub is sort of like the main public repository that you find out here. And then you find pretty much any Linux distro out there with various uh, incarnations. Um, NVIDIA with their drive, uh, sort of like CUDA, QDIN and all whatnot. Um, Engine X sort of like, so if you will find gazillions of images that you can use as a base image and then develop, for instance, your own images if you um, need to do some more things. <clears throat> um, in order to um, have a slightly more flexible backend, I'm using, I'm personally using actually Sonotype Nexus, which is also available as an open source version. Um, it can be sort of like a backend, not just for Docker, but also for um, PyPy and all kinds of other things. So you can basically have nice, a lot of different um, internal repositories that uh, shouldn't go outside your company, for instance. But if you're developing like open source software and whatnot, um, or just use it internally and just usually just pull images, but never push, then you can just uh, usually get away with just using Docker. <clears throat> it's worth noting that this is all very much Linux specific. BSDs and all that need not play. Yeah. Because it's all of these spaces. The yeah. Linux kernel is always full of these things. Yeah. File system namespace. Yeah. You yeah. Need, you know? yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's basically where it came from. And then just Microsoft saw, oh my God, they're just yeah. taking off with that. And yeah. they don't want to use our virtualization things anymore. Yeah. It's like, yeah, well, Hyper-V, who cares? If you can do lightweight Docker-V on, and you don't pay any license fees ever, <laughs> and you can scale easily. So all, all these things were added to Linux incrementally from about late 90s up until the early 2010s, and then boof, Docker came mm. on, put yeah. them all together. Yeah, and then yeah. Docker, exactly, put that all in a nice package with nice command lines, mm -hmm. easy to write scripts and whatnot, text files as once mm -hmm. again. And it just, yeah, went nuts enough. Thought like, oh yeah, who needs that? But then yeah, entered the deep learning world and I thought, hell yeah, you need that. So yeah. So in terms of installation, if you're just installing the, the command line interface, so that's on a Debian-based machine, you would just do a sudo apt install docker.io. So there used to be already a Docker uh, package available, which predates Docker, which I think is something with maybe a graphical doc or something. Um, but I'm not sure whether that's actually still actively um, maintained. But um, I usually, I don't know, I've done it so many times. I did a sudo apt install Docker, and then it didn't get it. Nice. So, what? Why did that not work? OK. Um, for people that want to have something a little bit more sophisticated, so Docker, the company also offers a Docker desktop, which is more of a graphical user interface. I've never used it. However, it does have um, changed this year its license um, or terms and conditions. So if you are in a company with uh, 250 employees or make more than 10 million a year, then you actually have to pay per person, per month and whatnot. So I don't know. I've never used it. I didn't. <laughs> there was no need to use the Docker desktop. So, but anyway. Yeah, you I can use the package is called WM Docker System Tray Docker Applications. That's what the old Docker that was, was the one, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Docker is now only a transitional package or is it completely gone? Uh, not yet gone. Oh, yeah. So they're both going to avoid. So Docker WM Docker. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's when you have short names, it's most likely that there will be a project out there that's already used it somehow. Okay, look, another one, OB and Docker, open virtual network drivers. Oh, okay, yeah. Open vSwitch. Right, once you've installed it, whichever um, iteration you're using, so I'm just going on the command line interface tool. Um, so you can basically pull an image just with the command docker pull in a URL. 
Um, so I'll flick to a um, command line very shortly. Um, so in this Docker pull hello world, this doesn't really look like a URL. So um, because so a URL, as you can see, can have um, several sort of like optional things in there, like the register URL. So if you don't specify a register URL, it just assumes Docker Hub implicitly. Um, so the image name that we're using here is hello world. Um, we also don't have a namespace in here because the hello world comes from, there's an official Docker image from Docker. So it's part of its library. So that gets dropped as well. And if you don't supply a colon tag at the end, it automatically assumes colon latest. So the first hello world is much simpler than Docker pull uh, Docker dot I, uh, HTTPS Docker IO slash library slash hello dash world uh, colon latest. So it makes it look a little bit uh, easier. But anyway, so you can basically with that URL format, you can basically use arbitrary um, registries and with the namespaces, um, for instance, for uh, you can have just uh, different distros and things like that in the end then as well. All right. Um, I'm going to go. Oh, I have it installed. Um, I just have. Oops. Okay. Zoom on that. Yeah, yeah. I just need to clean up first. Um, sorry. Um, it, I put that uh, up. Okay. Uh, oops. Let's see. Can I There's do another that? command. Is it like Docker Designer or something? Okay. Cool. Compose. Docker Compose. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, so Docker Compose is when you actually have to orchestrate multiple Docker containers. Mm -hmm. So you have like a database, a web server, um, some other backends and or multiple sort of like APIs running in parallel. So Docker container, what we're doing tonight is really just um, looking at a single application. So cool. Okay. Um, right. So if we're doing our hello world, so you can see that it's using default tag latest automatically. Um, and you can see here the full URL that was used, docker.io slash library, hello world, colon latest. So it's basically all the optional things that are in there are basically, or implicit things, um, get them resolved to that. So great, um, you've done that. Um, so if I do a Docker image list, you can see, oh, okay, hello world, latest. Um, was created 13 months ago and the size is 13.3 kilobytes. Wow. That's very small, um, which is nice. Okay, so we pulled off first image, woo -hoo, great. Um, so that's the first step. Um, so that's what I've done, uh, gone through here, sort of like Docker image LS. Um, you can list them. You can also do an inspect, um, Docker image um, inspect. So you can either go usually via the hash. So everything in Docker is sort of like hash, but you can give it tag names um, to make that a little bit easier too. Um, That's what the hash uses as the file name. Sorry? The hash you use the file name of the record. If you look at the it, some bar somewhere, the Docker. It, yeah, for storing it, but yeah. that's just the latest layer. So there can be other layers in between, which are also hashed. And the hash is actually derived from the commands in the description. We will get to that. <laughs> so, um, so if you do an inspect, you can sort of like, um, so repo tags, um, there are certain digests in there. So SHA-256. When it was created, the container itself, um, all that there's in is sort of like there's a command in there, um, things, there's no volumes attached, um, Docker version, 
Um, what else? Architectures, AMD 64 on Linux. Um, and yeah, that's a root. There's a JSON file. That's just output in JSON, yes, that's right. And for more complicated ones, you'd probably see a lot more information. Um, yeah, if you wanted to inspect things. Um, you can also then um, delete basically with the rm command, docker image rm. You can um, delete an image. Um, just going to list them again. Go um, yeah. oh, and delete it. Um, and then you can also do with docker image prune, you can sort of like remove sort of like clean up the system locally that oh. what's the emblem that, that are not being used by anything like containers or things like that and i think if, if i do prune minus minus a that really is an aggressive prune well didn't really do anything here that's all right okay so this is sort of like playing around with your templates that you can retrieve via a pull command um, but that's not very interesting because you actually want to do something with them. So with that, you use the run command and you don't actually need to pull an image first. You can also just immediately give it the URL and do Docker run. Um, so if I um, do a Docker run, hello world. So it does basically implicit. So if it can't find it, then it doesn't automatically Docker pull. Uh, pulls it. Yep. And... Um, we can now see sort of like the output here. So all it does is sort of like, hello from Docker, this message just shows that your installation appears to be working correctly, which is great. <laughs> Usually what uh, Hello World does. <laughs> if it so that container up. had no images, it's using the shell from your system. What does it contain? Does it just contain a shell script? I think it's just a shell script outputting that information. That's why it's like 13 kilobytes just to have that text in there nothing else so the command was really in there when we didn't inspect so the last command was a bash command so i think it's basically just outputting i would say it's just outputting that as a formatted long string that it, this blurb um, that you can see there then and, and that's that's it really sort of like this is sort of like for running um this in this in this case this particular uh container exits so other things like a web server, they would run continuously, so it wouldn't actually come back to that. So they would just basically run in the background. Um, this one um, actually stops. Is that shell script basically pid one? So what? Is that shell script pid one within the container? That would be in the container, yeah. Pid one, okay. Yep. So when that dies, the container dies. Yeah. So, yeah. So you can basically go into containers and do stuff, but as soon as you stop the container and remove it, that all the changes get lost because you always work off an image template. It's great when you're actually developing images. So you do all kinds of things, install libraries, so you figure out what's actually necessary for building your Docker image. Once you're done with that, you optimize the image a little bit and then build it and then push it out and then use it from then on. Because you can also attach local file systems Yes, you can. That's also that's uh, very useful as well, and we'll see that. Yep, yep. I mean, with databases, you could also use named volumes, so it's actually a separate um, space in the Docker daemon itself if you don't want to have it on the local system um, in a particular directory. So, cool. And that, uh, Lawrence already ma mentioned that, sort of like that we can also um, use volumes. I'm not going to go into the named volumes, um, which are sort of like a persistent state that's managed by the Docker daemon itself. Um, so you could install a MySQL database in a named volume, and then with Docker Compose, then they use that particular volume. It never actually goes to the host system, so the host system doesn't have to run that. You would have MySQL running in a pro in a Docker container that use that volume then. Yeah, in Docker Compose, you can basically then have in, in one container MySQL, um, a web server, and another in, um, in a named volume, sort of like you then have the actual persistent state of the MySQL database. So you actually don't have these files in a sort of like directory sitting on your machine. You could use it like that, but you don't have to. 
Um, so if you're just dealing with um, file exchange and whatnot, then you wouldn't you bother really with named volumes. Um, for most of what I do, I don't actually ever need to use named volumes. I just use the simple mapping, which is just mapping directories from the host system into the container. And that's done via minus V or dash dash volume. If you want to have more control about read, write, and permissions and all that, then you can use dash dash mount, which is for the things that I usually do complete overkill, minus V, sort of like your local directory colon and the container directory. That's it. That's usually sort of like sufficient for me. And what I namespace, the responses to namespaces. Yes. Yeah. And that's really handy. I mean, you just have to be aware of because the doc, Docker runs as your as root um, that you also give it sort of like um, things a minus U flag where you can then give um, the group ID and the user ID. So whatever is being when you're dealing with files, whatever you're writing out, you're writing that out as the current user, for instance. Otherwise, it gets written out as root and you as a mere mortal user can't delete it. So you actually have to go in the container and delete it from there. Can you run non-root containers, non-privileged containers? Um, I know there's some trickiness with that because there's a you can give each user a range of UIDs for the UID namespace, and then they can become root within that one little. It's I've only briefly looked at it. Have I'm you? honestly for for the things that I do, I actually don't have to really worry about that. So you just run it through, you just yeah, internal. Yeah, you you can specify then. I mean, there are commands how you actually run it from now on. Please run it as this particular user um, inside, sort of like uh, your Docker file description. Um, so you can switch the user then from root to something as a non-privileged one. Like I said, so non-privileged yeah. users can become root within that container. Yeah. You know, yeah. Can, yeah. You you give them a range of ten thousand yeah. user IDs that they can manage themselves so they can yeah. be the overland empire with yeah. yeah. Um I mean it makes it easier sort of like in a research context. Um the admins don't have to provide you root access on the machine. They just give you Docker and you do basically within Docker whatever you want to yeah. to get your research done and you can have and then you can also do whatever libraries that you need. You can install those and then that's it. And you, they don't have to bother with you anymore. They just, here's a base, install with Docker, do your thing. So you start a container for them and then they can do stuff with it. Is that how that works? Um, for us, they basically just provide us, okay, our users are able to use Docker on these machines and that's it. And then it's hands off for them. Oh. And we do sort of like build our own Docker images and use those for processing or building models and things like that. Okay, so moving on from, from the images thing, once you have a container, um, so if we're going back to our oops, hello world, um, if we're using the docker ls command, then like I said earlier, the command, ex, uh, the container exited, it's not running, so it doesn't list it. However, if I sort of like do minus a for all, then you can see that the hello world image uh, with that particular hash, that instantiation sort of like was created seven minutes ago and also exited seven minutes ago. And it also has, since hashes are quite hard to read, <laughs> Docker automatically gives it uh, a pair of random names. So this is a busy pair that particular Docker container. So rather than using the hash, you could also reference via that particular name. Um, so the image name itself is Hello World, and that also has a hash that can sometimes be a little bit confusing what we actually referring to and whatnot. But yeah, that's it basically. So, um, and in terms of, you can basically start stop container. So um, we could try, um, let's see whether we can start that one. Oops. Start and probably just exit. Yeah. 
um, that just outputs basically whatever this is, it automatically exits so it doesn't do anything. That would be the case start and stop is something what you would use like for a web server or things like that run constantly in the back. Um, just let me have a quick look. No, it only outputs sort of like the thingy itself. Um, start. I mean, we can have a look. Uh, oh, we might actually want to attach. That's the one. Oops. Busy pair. Um, because you can even run things within yeah. the attach. If we attach, then we see the output. And then, for instance, if you have a web server and that keeps running, then basically you see whatever is happening on it. Um, and you can just, and it, I mean, that allows you to also to attach to currently running ones. So it's not necessarily just. Um, the one that you start up that you can attach to, but also existing ones, so you can see what's happening. So that's why logging on the command line is once again very useful. <laughs> um, or you can also then use it interactive. Um, so if we're doing minus interactive, but yeah, once again, this just exits, so there's not much in there. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, have you now got a, a, a Docker container running? No, I actually cleaned my system, um, but um, I can probably. No, when, when you when you get around to it and you have a container running, I'd be interested to see what happens if you do a Docker container ls a, because I get I get containers appearing twice. I'm not quite sure why, but why don't we wait right. until that part of the talk? Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, we can cook something up then. Cool. And of course, we can also then remove oops, containers again. So if we're doing an LS again, we can see our hello world has been removed. Um, but if we're, of course, because that's just the container itself, um, if we're looking at the image, the image itself is still there. So in theory, we could then also then remove our hello world then and then yeah and then we if we want to really clean up then we do oops uh, and then you can properly clean up um yeah so that yes correct it's sort of it's your blueprint for that um to actually spin up because it's it's um it's like the kernel, you can, you can instantiate the kernel executable as of, or an executable as often as you want to. Any number of processes. Yep, and spawn basically any number of processes. And it's the same thing with basically a, an image in that sense. This is just a description of what happens in your application and it's your whole environment. Um, and that, spin that up, I mean, running the same. Um, Does it have like variables, like for example, an IP address? So you have an image, and then you run 10 images, and each one gets a different IP address. So in Docker Compose, you can have private networks, mm -hmm. so where all these processes then communicate with each other, and is then you can... Um, is that by DHCP? Is there some DHCP in there? That's or, up to you. Okay. But you, you specify basically your not subnet in there, so they can all communicate with that. And that, that's basically your Docker Compose YAML file, what the various um, Docker containers. Can specify allocate an IP address in the screen every time? Yeah, um, yes, so you can do that internally in there. Um, and you can also with, um, so if you have like 10 web servers, all from the same image, but they might actually use, serve different var HTML, sort of like directory. So you could map these things in and they serve on different IP addresses, for instance. Um, so you, because you can then map the internal port that for instance, your Nginx or Apache runs onto an external port. So they would basically then run on different ports externally and whatever, and it's always port 80 internally of all those 10 processes, but they would have 10 different I, sort of like uh, ports outside. Now, I end up um, having 
running into a lot of problems, and I'm not sure if that's related to that. We, I had um, speak up a bit. I had um, six different uh, six different Docker images running. Mm-hmm. Um, most of them were websites. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's Portainer, Tracker, um, uh, Pi-hole, you know, those sort of things. Mm-hmm. Um, some of them used MySQL, some of them used um, Postgres. Yeah, Postgres. Um, I think some of them probably had um, issues accessing certain ports. Are they complete, okay. treated as completely separate, or are they trying to go outside of their dockers? So by default, they can't communicate with the host. So you actually have to open up the ports. Um, so they are, if you use, um, for testing, <laughs> dash dash net um, equals host, that basically gives the container access to what's happening on the host. So if you have a MySQL database that is to be used on the host, you could just see, does that work then with that? Can they connect to that? So that shares the network namespace. Yes, so you basically open it up, whatever's on the host. I wouldn't recommend that on a production system. <laughs> you would really restrict it to the ports that you actually need rather than give it everything. But just for testing, for instance, or in development, that's usually what you would go for. And then once you actually push it out to production, you would clamp it down onto the various port mappings that you actually need. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to supplying. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Open world. This, I, I, I tried going back the other way and saying, well, instead of running, say, six different versions of um, a particular, say, MySQL database, mm-hmm. could I run one, portain, uh, one Docker that has um, a SQL database and yeah. open those ports so they can all talk? Yeah, that's, that's where you would use Docker Compose then, where you actually define your MySQL service and then all the other ones that then refer to that and they can then sort of like in their own little private network use that then. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I've done. Um, yeah. So you've, I, you've got- I personally you, don't use Docker Compose myself, but a colleague of mine, he does it for one of our systems. Yeah, so I have I have test systems running on my laptop and and they have their own network, which is quite uh, uh, walled off from the network that the laptop is running on around my home office. And so, you know, 0.0.0.0, if you like. Um, so in order for Word, um, WordPress to talk to MySQL, it simply needs to know that MySQL is operating on uh, port 3306. And the same thing, if you want... Um, access to the web server, then you might have that running on um, port 8080, for example. But you would have to, you have to then open, open that up so that from the, the laptop running natively, your web browser can still access that sort of internal network, if you like, on port 8080 or wherever you're running your um, web server. Thank you. Put WordPress in one container, MySQL in another container, and sort of plug them together. Um, that just that is what I've done, Lawrence. Um, but oh, that's okay. that's because of the way it came. I, I was able to get hold of a pre-built word process, uh, excuse me, WordPress, and a pre-built MySQL. So I I just okay. took what I was given. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you usually try to separate out the various processes so you can upgrade them individually. So So that way you can, for instance, upgrade to a new WordPress version without having to touch your MySQL application um, and then see does that still work or not. So for instance, if you're trying to test um, a newer version of WordPress with all whatever plugins that you're actually using in there, because that's usually usually not WordPress that's the issue. It's usually the plugins that are the problem. When you're upgrading the WordPress version, does that everything still work? So you could then test that to have a new image and then talk to the database and see what it actually looks like. 
um, externally. And if it doesn't work, you can just basically roll back to the older version and wait till the plugins have been fixed and then sort of like deploy a newer version. It, it makes sort of like for leaner images, so you don't have to package everything all the time. But like you explained, it was only 13K. I mean, that's... Yeah, amazing. I mean, the images that I work with can be like three, four gigabytes. Okay. So, <laughs> a bit but, on the heavy side. But, but, but the overhead of the container system itself seems very low. It is quite low. Um, however, if in terms, for instance, like NVIDIA's CUDA and whatnot, if you have lots of libraries that actually need in initialization, then you still have a lag of sometimes several seconds before something happens and you don't want that. So if you can have your database already there and you just uh, basically take down WordPress and then spin up the new version, then there's hardly any difference or a speed difference in between that just needs sort of like well, PHP needs to do its thing again, but uh, people are used to that <laughs> as a delay. But at least sort of like your database doesn't have to sort of like spin up again, warm up and whatnot, and um, start its caching of its tables and things like that. That can basically still reside in memory and keep running. So how many containers will you typically run once in dozens? For the use cases that, I, that I'm using it for, so... I, being a data scientist, I usually build pipelines and each one of these pipeline building blocks are usually quite heavy weight things that then run in conjunction with GPUs and whatnot. And they came like two, three or so, but each one of them can be several gigabytes. And then they take up basically all the RAM on the GPU for processing data then. Um, so it's a bit, so that's, I have a slightly different use for Docker, like then the web development people where they have, they have lots, lots of, of microservices. Lots of microservices. Um, so Docker is great, or Docker Compose you would use for these microservices then. I'm sort of like on, at a different end of the spectrum where I have- Fewer larger ones. Yeah, fewer larger ones. And there, yeah. there's another, another aspect that's dissimilar to Peter's description, um, but which probably relates to the gentleman whose voice I didn't recognize speaking before, um, that if you have multiple projects, or in my case, multiple clients who are all using databases, let, let's assume, for example, they're all using MariaDB, um, then uh, you don't want to have client A's software on the same database, on the same MariaDB container as client B. So you can actually have two versions of MariaDB running, not necessarily simultaneously, but because they're in separate containers, they're, they're quite separate. So you're, you're able to ensure that client A's data or client A's work is quite separate from client B's. I can imagine like you could have a database, client A has a database called print, client B has a database called print. And, and, you and there you go. Yes, you've highlighted a big problem with namespacing. Yep. I remember the good old days of WordPress. Use a prefix for the tables. <laughs> That is such a stupid <laughs> idea. That is such a stupid idea. Yeah. Uh, the, the way the multi site system works. You know, the multi site WordPress? And that is, oh, it makes it so much, so awkward. Yeah. Uh, uh, trying to construct queries when you've got dynamic table names and then. Yes, you know, I know. Yeah, it's fun and games, but yeah. They, they'll have to fix it eventually. It's going to be painful, cool, but they're going to have to fix it. Yeah, I mean, with, with Docker, you can sort of like then change that because then you have different database instances and WordPress instances. You can have different versions for particular clients running. Yeah, and for instance, if, the, if a client could be, if you have different tiers basically for paying customers, or if you're willing to risk newer versions and be our pilot user, then you always get something new, but you pay less because your site might not work. <laughs> That's entirely uh, separate users here. Yeah, yeah. That okay. See, WordPress multi-site. Mm. You have a common user database. Yeah. You know, so there's no way. There's no but, way. Over. I know, but with that you can separate that then as well. Um, so yeah. where, if you have access to the database, you can see the other clients' tables, yeah. uh, which is not really what you would want. But, um, but also, so. also picking up on what Peter is doing that. If, if you have separate single word process, uh, WordPress 
instances, you can pick up that Docker container and, and transmit it to your client. Whereas if you're using multi-user WordPress, WordPress, I'm having trouble tonight, aren't I? If you're using multi-user WordPress, you could not pick that up and send it to client A if it had client B information in it. So this is a way of keeping things separate. Mm. And in my case, let's say I have two WordPress instances and two database instances that correspond. I'm not running all four at the same time because I'm either working for client A or I'm working for client B. So that means that you know they're, <laughs> they've been the the ones that I'm not working on are being put to sleep and they're not consuming any resource whatsoever mm. apart from disk. Yeah, yeah, makes it nice for separation. Yeah, and and delivery because you can just yeah. pick it up and throw it over the wall. Yeah. Do you actually use like private registries for these things then that your clients can pull these things from, or how do you go about that? Uh, well, that's usually in their domain because I'm right. independent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So do you use basically their own internal registries then that you get access to? Yeah. That I think that's the most satisfactory way of doing it because yeah. it puts control where it belongs yeah. and, and therefore I, as a risk, I only represent a risk for what I have and what I'm doing. Yeah. And yeah. Yep. And it's also a way to make sure I don't have access to production data and things yep. that I shouldn't. So yep. it's quite good from that point of view, both for yep. their their peace of mind and and to a degree for my feeling of security. If what I don't know can't hurt me, or what I don't yeah. know, <laughs> none of my business. <laughs> That's right. Cool. All right. So we've seen how we can sort of like. So most people in the audience already know more than Docker that I'm actually talking about. But anyway, it's sort of like a, a small scale introduction here. So when you actually, so, so far we've pulled image, run images, but, uh, and use containers and these things, but at some stage you get to the point that you actually want to build your own images. Um, and then, or you come across an image on the internet and oh, I actually want to use it, but it's not in Docker Hub but somebody might basically let Docker image available for instructions that's in a Docker file, text file. And in order to build an image, you basically just use the build sub command and it's as simple as docker build dot in theory. Dot is the directory where the Docker file is in there. I have to extend the particular slide a little bit, I think. And you can, in order to find it again, give it a tag name because a hash or a funny name is not great. Anyway. So for creating an image, sort of like, I think the previous slide was supposed to be deleted, but anyways, so you basically open a text editor uh, of a file that's called Docker file. The really basic com uh, com Docker specific commands and the first one is from, that's basically your base image. So the great thing about Docker is that it's um, just like an ogre, it has layers, just like onions. Um, and you can build, uh, so you can build on existing images um, and you don't have to stuff everything in there. So if you have a common middle layer in there, you can specify basically an image that has all that and then deploy that, for instance, either your internal um, registry or Docker Hub, if it's for open source software, for instance, and then you can use that sort of like image then for other images then as well. Um, with run, you basically execute a command that could be installing packages, um, apt install or pip install, these things, um, environment, env is sort of like for setting like environment variables, um, sometimes for setting time zone information, because sometimes Debian prompts you and then your Docker build fails because, oh, please enter the time zone information and nothing happens. And you wonder why after why after a few minutes your Docker build fails um, and then certain things can happen if there's an interactive prompt. Copy, that basically copies files from your host into the image and so that you don't go walkabouts in the directory tree up and uh, around the system 
you can only basically work in the same context where the Docker file, text file is located or into subdirectories that are located in that particular directory. You cannot go up. So copy um, dot dot slash or whatever doesn't work. So you can sort of like sneakily copy everything that's sort of like in root on your machine into this image and deploy and then get whatever was on this machine. So um, there's a little bit of um, thought that needs to go into there as well. Work directory, that really sets your current work directory in the image. Um, so you can then um, do things in that particular directory. So it automatically um, creates it as well. Um, so quite often I use that for as a last uh, command in there. Okay, I want you to be actually here in this particular directory then there to do three other things. As I said, Docker is basically around um, layers. Um, and whether Docker rebuilds layers depends on whether it detects a change. And the change basically depends on whether the hash of the previous commands plus the current command has changed. So if you have, if you do a pip install, I'm going to use pip install, um, what did you install, Ian, for Qt6? Pip install something? PySide 6. So if you do a, a pip install PySide 6, then it will always just grab the lightest. But if you say pip install PySide 6 equals equals a specific version, could be 6.0.0, for instance, and then use that specific version because that's actually what you want to do because you want to have specific versions of your environment where you know I've verified that things work with that. So if you're rolling things out to the client while you were working on it, you probably could want to skip sort of like specifying particular versions. But when you're actually setting things in stone, then, then you specify the versions or you use a requirements txt file with specific versions in there. Because if in the meantime, an upgrade happened and that breaks everything and you roll it out to the client, it's not great. But with a pip install PySide 6, if the version changes, Docker doesn't know, even though there's a new version out there and you want to use a new version, you've already built a layer with it and it says, yeah, whatever, it hasn't changed that line, so I'm not doing anything. So you want to have pip install, as a run pip install PySide 6 equals equals 6.0.1 then and that's oh this has changed so this layer plus all subsequent layers will then basically be rebuilt into your new image so it's also a bit of thought needs to go in um, where certain things will change most likely so keep operating system stuff right at the top after you're from statement basically and then other things that are a bit more dynamic look at sort of like where things are most likely to change and put those at the end that only sort of like the fewest amount of layers need rebuilding at the end but that's sort of like further down if you have time and you don't worry about that yeah you can stuff things in wherever you want to but um, if you're building images a lot especially during development time they can get old real real quick if you're rebuilding and um, pulling things because you're always starting with a very small base image pulling updating ubuntu for instance and stuff like that and after, it takes a while pulling stuff and installing and things so you want to make that as quick as possible yeah so um that's the docker build command and you give it a name uh, so you can actually use it and run it with that particular tag name so that is the equivalent of the hello world that we used earlier um, a little bit about cleanup um, so docker stop and um, if you don't want to go through all the various um, running containers you can do that with um, outputting sort of like docker processes all and minus Q and then you basically get a list and you can basically stop all of these containers immediately and the same thing you can do then with docker rm it removes all those containers and then you can do at the end the docker system prune minus i sort of like if you want to do a proper um, cleanup because the problem can be that when you're developing with um, various images and whatnot that 
there might be newer ones or you're working off an old one and things don't work so quite often when i'm testing things i actually clean my system and then pull things fresh again and see does everything actually work as expected so when i think i'm done i actually test am i done <laughs> that helps when a container is an instance of an image yes. so what does removing a container mean does it when you stop a container it's still there it still takes up space so is it it's stayed on this yes uh, so you can actually go into a container if it's interactively you can install further things so you, you start with the image, but you can then basically go in there, install more things, do other things, till whatever, or inspect things, analyze stuff. So, oh, something didn't work. Oh, I need to install some libraries. Oh, no editor install because you're trying to keep your system or your image quite lean. So, you install a few other bits and pieces. So, you grow your container and, it, and that is still alive, and you can still stop it and start it again, or pause and then resume um, and then do stuff with it. And then you actually want to remove these containers and see, um, okay, now we start again with my image. Does that actually work with all the work that I've done and modified my image? Spin it up. Yes, actually, I can confirm it is working. Because you can do a lot of things while working on something till you think that you've got everything working. Because sometimes it's also important what the order of your commands in your image are, that, that, that this actually all works and while you're fiddling with stuff. You might actually get the order wrong while you're writing them into your image file and whatnot, but it's along those lines. Um, so, as a, um, so I'm still going to um, try and do some things on the fly after the slides. So we've already talked a little bit about that. So you really want to um, use it for isolating ap applications. Um, David was using it for isolating, for instance, um, clients. So that one particular um, client database can only be accessed by a particular um, software and whatnot. I use it a lot for um, conflicting library requirements. So a lot of the deep learning libraries that I work with have certain CUDA requirements, QDNN, yes. And um, that comment from the audience there, yeah, that you really sh <laughs> can shoot yourself if you're trying to get that going on a system, but if you package all that up and NVIDIA basically provides base images where they actually have CUDA and QDN installed, you use that as a starting point. Or if you use a particular PyTorch or TensorFlow version, then they're building on top of NVIDIA's base images and have all the relevant bits installed for that. So you just use basically one of those multi uh, sort of like already extended base images and then add your things just to that. So you can make it relatively slim in what you actually just have to do on the image. So your images can, or your Docker file descriptions can be relatively simple and you don't have to worry about, about all the niggly bits that happen underneath the hood there because you're just using these already provided ones. And yeah, and it allows you really sort of like because, um, for instance, my pipelines quite often have various frameworks in there and they have conflicting CUDA versions. But since with Docker you can pass through the um, GPU to those containers, they then basically see it um, just as the GPU that they're using and they're grabbing memory on there and whatever it is. And CUDA is nicely in, sort of like isolated mm -hmm. within that particular container and you have no problems with those. Uh, conflicting things anyway. The only thing that you have to have is the NVIDIA driver installed on that machine and the Docker runtime environment. Do you have to worry about um, uh, two different Dockers trying to, uh, Docker images trying to access the one GPU? Yes, if they want to grab all the RAM, yes. But that's usually only at training time when they're actually really resource hungry. They're usually less resource hungry at when they're actually just doing inference. So there you can basically, depending on the size of your GPU, you can usually run multiple sort of like models in one GPU. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a balancing act because you have to think about that images or data has to go across the bus and back. So if there's multiple conflicting things going on, then you sort of like have a IO bottleneck there. So the, if you're running too many processes on your GPU, you might actually be slower than without a GPU. <laughs> <laughs> but 
it's you have to test it and i mean if it's a sequence of stuff happening then it might actually work and if the if the throughput it's not necessarily too high then you can have probably multi even several heavyweight models actually running on a single gpu rather than having a multi gpu system yeah and then um the great thing is with with docker you can run multiple versions in theory so you can deploy multiple images and then in production you use a particular version you, and then you start developing a new version so for instance if you have a new WordPress instance that also requires a new MySQL or MariaDB instance and whatnot. So you can actually work with that and then um, you can deploy new versions on, on the Docker side. And I mean, you, the great thing about Docker file being a text file, you can also version that as well then too, so that you're actually deploying that and you can also see what changes actually happen to the script. Why is that not working? <laughs> That's usually the case where you go back. <laughs> why is something not working? And depending on how you write your, your Docker file scripts, it's about if you never actually supply any versions in there, it's the same thing in, in, in Python world. You do pip install, just do this. Yeah, six months down the track, this shit no longer works. Because unless you... So anything that you find on medium.com, oh, follow this easy to... Um, easy to I don't know. Follow just my great tutorial on how to do that. 90% of the time, I can't get that to work anymore because rather than at the end supplying, yeah, these are the actual versions that I used. I mean, it would be a simple pip, fr pip freeze that they could supply at the end. Um, so you can actually figure out what's actually going on. You can still keep the tutorial easy, just do a pip and solve these things and keep it nice and easy. But yeah, tell me what you used. Um, so, and then yeah, with, with Docker, sort of like once you have an image, that's basically set in stone and then you can just spin it up. And that's great also for like legacy software, for instance, for our old outdated WLUG wiki, that could would have been sort of like something. And I'm not sure whether um, Daniel actually runs the whole thing as a Docker image or a yeah. container on his system um, or whether he uses another pro uh, approach with virtualization maybe, but Docker would be, for instance, one way of having this really outdated PHP version <laughs> and you isolate that rather than running that on your host system and giving everyone basically access to your host system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, cool. Um, so being a data scientist myself, um, I wrote a little introduction for data scientists you can find that the first URL um, and then because Docker can do so much more and it's a bit mind-boggling actually going through the reference and trying to that's uh, our applied machine learning group uh, us three <laughs> <laughs> um, and we also have our own internal registry so we're using this Nexus um, from um, a repository manager from Sonotype. I've been using it for Yongs for actually Maven. That's where I was actually coming from, but they've uh, upgraded it over the years for managing various other sort of like, whether it's NPM, um, Maven, Docker, uh, PyPy, all these various gazillions of that they actually support in OS sort of like registry formats. And that is, I found easier to use as a web-based interface as well, where you can browse and things like that automatically in there. And then you can also easily work with um, user management and permissions and things like that. So that's why I'm using it also for Docker. Um, cool. That's that. Um, so I can probably... Um, show some of the um, um, Docker images that I'm using. Um, what's a good one? Um, let's have a look there. One of these. So let's make that a bit bigger. So here's one of the object detection frameworks that we're using come 
originally came out of the um, Hong Kong University. Uh, it's called MM Detection. Um, I use basically their um, base images and then have particular custom bits that are sort of like put in there to make that work for us. Um, and if we're looking um, at um, this particular image, um, so you can see the from, you can ignore sort of like the registry. So um, with ARC, you can sort of like also have um, sort of like build arguments in there in the script. Um, so by default, it goes onto my internal registry because that caches, it works as a proxy, it caches images, which makes the pulling faster being on the local network rather than pulling it always from probably the US or wherever the next node is from Docker. Um, so if you're building images a lot, that kind of like lessens a little bit the internet traffic that you're generating, especially if those images are several gigabytes all the time. So speed and data traffic. So in this case, I'm basically using an NVIDIA um, base image. Um, so I'm using CUDA 11.1 with CUDA and 8, and it's sort of like development image. And that's actually based on Ubuntu 2004. That's sort of like one of their base images that they're using. Um, and NVIDIA being NVIDIA, they're sometimes a pain in the butt. Um, they change their GPG keys for the repo. So in order sort of like now to make that work, I had to update in the Ubuntu 2004 base image, which hasn't has the GPG keys updated. I need to update basically the key. So I need to fetch something from NVIDIA, update my cache because otherwise my up, app get or apt update fails because it doesn't know the key. So I was trying to rebuild an image because um, usually I don't do anything with that once an image has been deployed, but it turns out I had a bug in there. So I redeployed the image and it failed. I said, what? <laughs> And I said, you look at it, and I said, why does that fail? And then gazillions of people are, oh, yeah, we, we rotate our GPG keys. Oh, great. Why? Nice. Why? <laughs> so, and then you have to add other things in there. But, yeah, they supply that. Any simple fix that would online? Yeah, so, um, I mean, it is in theory one line, but sometimes it's basically I can use sort of like the same three lines and copy that into other images when I have a different base, like 18.04 or 22.04. Um, so I just change that particular variable so I don't have to find that where in the URL that is. So I can just change that. So you can see that you can use these um, distro args sort of like basically as variables then. So this is basically just shell arguments, <laughs> variables Why that you can... Arcs, then, uh, arcs are not persistent. They're just at build time. Okay, they're, they're just variables in the script. Yeah, there's just variables in the script that they disappear again once you have built the image. Env is, stays persistent for the containers mean? then. Because one thing that's always annoying is the time zone. It asks you, oh, okay, because depending on what, what libraries you install, Debian then asks you, oh, we need to know what um, time zone you are because the base image doesn't have that information because it could be anywhere. But there's no, there's no need for the concept of a system time zone. Yes, but it asks you, and that means the build fails. Or oh, during the installation. During the installation, it prompts you. Usually, you are interactively installing that. And for that, you need to have sort of like that environment sort of like set Debian front and non-interactive. So it doesn't prompt you. Um, so that's an application of the ENV sort of like command then. Yeah, and you can see here, run is really like whatever um you're doing on your system for whether that's installing libraries and things like that but one thing is to keep in mind each layer is treated separately so if you don't clean up temporary bits within a layer they will stick around having another command another run command afterwards you can delete them but the overall size is still there because it still pulls the full previous layer even though it might appear like it's gone afterwards. So what you need to do is um, when you're doing, for instance, apt 
first of all, you need to update that and then install your thingies, but you also need to remove sort of like clean any sort of like um, temporary files and the cache that you need to remove. That's sort of like things that you need to keep in mind. And the same as then if you're doing pip install, uh, sort of like pip install, then you should usually always with a no cache deal. So it doesn't keep them, especially um, deep learning libraries are large. So PyTorch 760 megabytes, TensorFlow, a few hundred megabytes here and whatever dependencies that you have. And so you usually easily double basically your layer because you have all these cache things, which is great on a development machine or whatnot, because if you install the same version, again, it doesn't need to download it, but not in a Docker image. So you have to be careful sort of like a little bit how you construct things. But that's something that you do once you've developed sort of like a working image and you actually want to optimize it. The Debian front end is variable. Yeah. You don't need it after the app command, so do you? Can you unset it afterwards? Not with ENV, that stays persistent then. I mean, it, you can't, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. People say try to avoid using ENV because it's persistent for subsequent layers. And I'm not 100% sure whether you can do that or not. Because you could, because the run is just shell commands. So yes. You could, you could put a variable equals value on the shell command. The that's what I tried and failed. No. So that's why I had to revert to that. that. That's something I use quite often as well, that I actually just for this particular command, I set it there. And, but I think it might just run in the same shell, maybe. Um, for one or the other reason, or maybe it was back in the day that it didn't work, but I had to revert basically to that um, because it didn't, it still prompted me and the build still failed. Yeah, and then there's all kinds of other things uh, when you're doing things with um, deep learning. Um, yeah, but I mean, the other things also you can then um, do get clone, for instance. So you pull in sort of like other um, libraries and whatnot. Um, you use, then switch to a particular uh, version there and whatnot. Um, here's the work directory. So. In this case, uh, it already exists, but for whatever I'm doing afterwards, this is my work, current working directory. I install all kinds of other things in there. Um, does, it get, does it have to be in the container or can it run your local git? No, it's in the container. So if we're, sorry, if we're looking up there, um, you can see I'm installing git here. Okay. So that actually runs in there. <clears throat> and there has to be left behind afterwards. Yes, and <clears throat> you could put everything in one line, but if there's one error in there or something fails, then you're stuffed. So that's why certain, so it's kind of like, you have to think of what, what are things that you might use again or further down the track and Git is not particularly large. I have an image, I'm pulling down hundreds of me uh, megabytes of other libraries, Git with its few megabytes, who cares? So that's not going to change much uh, of the overall 3.5 gigabyte image size much. So, if, if you had this in, um, say, get and say um, your um, your video drivers, was it CUDA DNN eight? Yep. yep. Installed as part of the operating system. Would it still try and download the Docker image of that, or would it try and use that? So you're saying that you have you have a developer machine where you have a GPU card and you have CUDA and QDN already installed. Yes. Yeah. And then in your Docker file image, um, so this is a complete separate process. It starts with your base image. Does it go and download a brand new operating system? Yes. And so whatever from yeah. you're using, that's basically what it's pulling in. It's sort of like it always starts that as a clean slate. So it ignores whatever is on your system. So that's a nice thing. It's a complete separation. So whatever is in that base image, that's what it's using. If there's things missing, then you need to install them. I mean, that's why it's so great because installing CUDA and all these, um, or even TensorFlow and sometimes PyTorch can be a real pain in the ass. If you can basically use an already pre-existing image, that makes your life easier. 
because you don't have to maintain it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I think PyTorch, they use um, Anaconda, which means that the base images will be already a lot larger than they used, have to be, but that's life. <clears throat> it's always um, a balance between how much time do you want to spend on it, trying to get it going yourself versus it's already there, and disk space is cheap, internet traffic is cheap, your time isn't, and you grow older by the hour. <laughs> So um, I've um, tried actually, so I did actually with one older version, I think even with that library, um, where I, rather than using um, Anaconda, I switched it to just plain Ubuntu 20 or 4 image or something, um, or another base image where and then installed other bits and pieces and I shaved basically one gigabyte off that I didn't need, rather than whatever was provided already. So. It, it, it depends on where you want to optimize and whether that's necessary. I mean, if it's um, really necessary that you have to have as small as possible image size, then you can optimize because then somebody is probably paying for that time. If it's about getting something quickly out the door and size doesn't really matter, then go with whatever's there. Um, yep. There we still have some copy commands. That's basically where I'm just copying then various files into various locations. So one thing that I found quite useful is uh, having a custom bash RC file that outputs a little message. Um, I ins let myself inspire by TensorFlow. <laughs> they had one of these. Um, and it outputs, um, oh, you're running this as root. Be careful, this might sort of like change the uh, permissions of certain files that you might generate during the lifetime of this particular container. Or if you're not running it as root, then it says, oh, great, you're sweet, you're all set up, should be no problem if you're creating files and stuff. So, And then I also put sort of like a custom um, sort of like banner in there that what particular image that is. So I actually know when you're dealing with lots of images, you start something up, oh, that's the one, yeah, okay, rather than you see a prompt like said, where am I now? And I wrote a little Python library for do for generating these bash RC files. Um, cool. Um, yeah, so this is really sort of like fiddling around with uh, integrating some bits and pieces, extending basically the frameworks that they have to make it work for us. And then I can just spin up that particular image. Quite often I use it interactively um, because um, and then map um, directories in there. Um, but for long, or if I'm running experiments that work on lots of different data sets uh, with lots of different algorithms, I basically just script that with some nested for loops. And in that case, it will be non interactive, where basically the building of the models just happens one after the other. I push through data and then later on evaluate that whatever comes out and that can be nicely scripted outside. And I just call basically my Docker run rather than in the in actor in rather than in, in oh my god rather than in interactive mode, just um, exit once you're done. So that's why I'm sort of like probably not what usually what people use things for. I just have um, sort of like data processing capabilities in there rather than microservices. Ooh, right. Um, do I have some other? So for instance, we can look at the um, big blue button render one. So in this case, um, so this is quite a simple one. So that's um, um, just running off Ubuntu 18.04. And you can see there's once again, no, re uh, no registry and no um, sort of like namespace. Ubuntu is also considered sort of like a very important sort of like thing. So Debian, um, Ubuntu, Alpine, and probably Fedora, sort of like the more common ones, they don't have that particular namespace prefix. They're part of the Docker library. So you can sort of like have that a bit shorter. Um, 
that's sort of like all the various um, GStreamer plugins and all that that you need for processing um, the big blue button thing. And once again, sort of like I clean up after I've installed all that. Um, I then go and opt. Um, do I get clone of the person who actually managed to, how can I actually, uh, so there's one guy um, who actually maintains that, which I just use and I just basically package in a Docker image and then bung in a few little scripts that makes life a little bit easier. So I can just run one command and it generates me a video, an MP4 file out of it, out of a whole big blue button recording. And yeah, so basically cop everything that is in, so if we're going, I'll just go out quickly again. Um, so here's, um, so what starts running when you start this container? You don't nothing. nothing. Um, so I actually have some little scripts in there. So, so that would, uh, when you go into the container, you end up in that workspace? Yes, I end up in basically in there. And what I, so, so what I basically run here, so this here you can see also, um, with the minus U, um, I'm basically mapping the current user ID and group ID um, into the container. So that way, whatever, so the files that it's generating in, in the directory that I'm running things in um, have my sort of like um, user and group ID, so I can actually easily delete them again rather than doing that from within the Docker container. And then um, here's an example of the minus V. So I run that basically in the directory where I wanna create stuff. Uh, so I basically pass in um, PWD, the output of that, map that into slash workspace in the container. It doesn't need an absolute path thing, you can't say dot slash workspace. Correct, it needs absolute paths. Because um, I think it's trying to get around some shenanigans that could happen with relative paths and whatnot. Some links. Yeah. There are there are limits called to get around that. Open app. Yeah. yeah. It's it is what it is. Use use absolute paths and that's it then. And then you can see minus T, so it's tag. So I deployed that um, and then just use the lightest. So if we're going on Docker Hub. Um, um, Jeremy Ellison gave a talk at the Cybercom a few months ago, uh, ranting on about symlinks. Right. About how they break the whole POSIX file system model. <laughs> yeah, so um, you can see here on Docker Hub, so um, that's my username, and so that's the namespace. So you can just register as a user, and then you can basically deploy. Um, applications or um, other images there. In this case, I just named it BBV render. Um, and you can see these tags are there. So um, then, um, so was, that was when New Zealand Open Source Society was switching um, their backend. So the initial Docker image that I had was no longer working. So I had to look into it and I basically created a new image then until I had that working and then pushed it out. So I basically just use that now. And then if that should happen again, then I can basically just once up, once again, upgrade my a new Docker image and then start using that. Um, and yeah, and then so basically just have a little script here that takes the presentation link that, um, is available from the uh, Big Blue Button website, and then just give it a name. And then it basically goes off and downloads the files, creates whatever um, renders, and then finally at the end of the day, generates um, like an MP4 file. And it can just sit in the background and it usually takes like half an hour, or depending on how long the presentation is, I think. It's, it's, it's faster than real time at least. So I think it's twice as fast. So if I've been talking for too long, oh yeah, looks like it. Um, then, so if it's like a one and a half hour presentation then it takes about 45 minutes sort of like to render and, and turn that into an MP4 file. And then I can 
post process that in like for instance PTV um, chop off start and uh, end bit um, put in a sort of like a starting slide and an ending slide on it and then render that again and that's what I then upload to YouTube. <laughs> so um, it's re encoded twice. Yes, because that's just the raw thing, because that's whenever you press the start stop button for recording. So uh, for instance, I will now have to edit that little awkward bit in where Ian threw, uh, kicked me out. <laughs> have to find that, um, basically kick that out um, and then um, have sort of like that as a nice, nicer video then. Would it be better to use a bulkier but less lossy intermediate format? Oh, I know. Uh, it doesn't really matter much. I mean, it's most of the time seeing console output or me talking gibberish in the background. Re-encoding doesn't make me any more beautiful or worse. So it doesn't really make much difference in that case. For professional stuff, I definitely agree. Um, you would use something else. But this is really about a community sort of like channel and I think um, that's mostly it really. And yeah, so coming back to um, Big Blue Button and then yeah, this was sort of like one um, of the applications where I thought, oh yeah, when I couldn't get it to work and Lawrence was basically rendering it for me, yeah, it works for me. So I decided, okay, I'll put that in a Docker container. Uh, and that's the end of the story. And it's just easy. Yeah, it's just one command where I basically run things with and don't have to worry about it. And it can do its things. Cool. That's it, um, I think. Um, I think I've already talked long enough. Um, that's why I also linked. Um, so for, for people who might be more interested in, so that's why I linked basically the Docker reference plus my introduction to Docker a little bit in there. So there's also some tips and tricks in there, sort of like, yeah, that I sort of like accumulated over the, over time, which I find useful and which I use as my reference for, for my, my work. So um, feel free to have a look at it. Um, and I will upload that to our GitHub um, repo then as well. So you can get the PDF from there then with the links and it's on such a YouTube video, hopefully. Cool. In that case, any questions? Obviously, I think in terms of LXC, the big value add that Docker adds is the building system. Yes. The building system, yeah. The registry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think just all the building blocks were there and they just packaged it up and gave it also an easy to use command line interface so you can actually do things and also script things, automate builds and these things. So that's, yeah, but I think. The building, the building system that mm -hmm. the profile. Yeah. That yeah. seems like a big thing. Yeah. And then sort of detecting changes. I mean, at the start of it is quite annoying. Oh, there's a new version of my library available, but you didn't use a version, so it doesn't notice it, so it doesn't build anything. Why? Oh. So what do you, you can clear out your crap and start again, force it to clear out? Yes, so you can also, um, when you do a Docker build, you can also uh, basically um, no cache, but then it basically pulls everything. Everything again. However, if you space, so another trick is sort of like have a random arc. Can you, can you flush the cache back to a particular layer? No. Presumably there is. It'll, possibly, but it's much easier either using versions or use an arc blah equals one. And everything after that will get rebuilt or arc and then change it to two. And everything after that gets rebuilt. So that's you sort of. Back out again afterwards. Right? You can take it back out again afterwards. Yeah, once you're done with it, you take it out again, then it gets rebuilt too, but for your production system. So if there's a problem with something, you can sort of like insert that and everything because it changes the hash because there's additional text in there. This this line plus everything after that will get rebuilt because it's sort of like each layer plus, I think it's the hash that comes out of all the previous layers plus the new command is a new hash. And if that's different, <coughs> if that's not cached, then it will actually start rebuilding and everything from there on. And then each layer sort of like, it consumes everything previous. I mean, you can probably still have some hash collisions, but fingers crossed that they're not that common. This one, like, some way of doing a separate modification 
understand for each game could almost have been trying to escalate the end of his record or something. Go wild. It's really up to you. But the thing is, um, copy will always be executed. So you would want those actually at the end. So whatever change, if your scripts change, then it, they will always get put basically in your image. So you have those basically at the end. Those it's, are not cached. Yeah, they're not cached. So they always come basically in your image and that's it then. If you've got a, um, you know, a web server, a web server on your... Um, in the Docker thing, do you reckon you've got more protection from you know hackers and stuff like that? Well, they won't attack your system, your host system. So if that container gets attacked, then yeah, you just spin it up again, um, or you upgrade it to a newer version because whatever Nginx has a fix for that particular problem, and then you build a new image and start that up. But it only compromises that particular container, but not everything. Yeah. So I think by uh, by the kernel providing sort of like these namespaces and C groups and whatnot, it really isolates things, and it doesn't go. I mean, yeah. it always depends on how you run things. If you open up your host system with dash dash net equals host, then it's your own fault. But I mean, if you're doing stupid things, it doesn't sort of like um, prevent you from doing stupid things. But if you follow best practices really how to run things, then it really sort of like only affects that one particular container. And I mean, some of you might actually remember Matt Ocean, a long guy ago, we had um, the, the admin uh, from over there. He was, I don't know, it goes back a long time. That was early days of Docker. It was only a few years old. He was actually using Docker there in order for actually running their backend system. And he used it quite often for pushing out new versions or testing new versions, like A-B testing and whatnot, so, and then load balancing and other things. So that's why the whole hash, hashing thing was lost, mind boggling, boggling at the start. You think, oh God, I'm not gonna read hashes here and whatnot, but once you actually start using it, you actually, I personally never bother really with hashes because I give, my images names and whatnot, and then the containers, I usually stop all containers, remove those and start from the images again, once I'm done basically with the development. And that's it then. If you look at the man set of names, namespaces, man big, that list of all the namespaces, the different kinds of namespaces that Linux supports. All so right. Even network interfaces can be their own namespace, file systems of course, user IDs, uh, even the host name, there's a separate namespace just for the host name. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you can right. pretend you're a hosting. Interesting, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, a lot of mm. zillions of all the things that can yeah. be compartmentalized. Yeah. David, do you have any questions or comments? Process IDs have their own namespaces. Time, even time. And you think each one can have a different idea of time? Oh, David might be having dinner. No, he's waiting for Lawrence to finish his comment. Oh, <laughs> yeah, you, you can talk over him sometimes. <laughs> That's all right. I can try. Um, yeah, uh, so on my system, I have containers and I have images. And how does one tell which one feeds into the other? Uh, so which which are related, or vice versa? How can you tell which images you can remove without worrying about your containers that you've built? Um, if you, they won't allow you to remove an image if you still have containers that use it. Um, well, obviously, I haven't tried that yet. Oh. Yeah, so I tried that actually earlier. So I was running the. Um, so we can have a look at that. Um, so we had the... Okay, running the Hello World thing again. So if I'm doing image list, um, it shows me the image. So if I go container, oops. Then I still have a container there, even though it's no longer running. And you can see that it's not admiring Euclid rather than um, 
what it was before. Um, so if I wanted to, to remove the image, hello world, and it says unable to remove because it's still referenced by uh, a particular container. So that prevents you from accidentally removing an image that's actually still being used. Very good. I had I hadn't dared try. So um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can understand. I always found that annoying. But I want to remove that image. Just remove everything with it, and that's why I came sort of like um, that's why I sort of like uh, use a particular one liner that stops all containers, removes all containers, mm -hmm. and then does a hard prune. Why and not that, create a test container for running Docker within it? Um. If possibly, <laughs> um, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I mean, then you throw everything away, of course. But yeah, you just have to be. I mean, then port mapping is a bit of a nightmare. So I think just cleaning things every now and then, or well, might be easy. Yeah, yeah. Then when you have something you want to see, you can export it up. Right? You could do that. Yeah. But uh, I mean, for my cases, um, that was usually fine working with that. Container exception. Yeah. Is, but yeah, so is, is there a setting which will automatically restart containers when you reboot the host system? Or there, is, there is a service. Um, is, it, is it by default these days, or do you have to run yeah, that? that? I, I forgot what it's called. Yeah. Um, There'll be a systemd service file. Yeah, there's yes and no. You can also do, um, oh, I think it's an auto restart or always restart. Um, yeah, that sounds familiar. Um, not restart, no. Um, automatically, next one up. The one you looked at, Peter, uh, automatically. Um, sorry, this one? No, next one, next one. You already looked at this before. Next one up. Above it, above, ah, that one. It's a restart policy. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, exactly, a restart um, unless stopped. So if you actually manually stop it, then it won't restart. So you can um, specify when you actually run that particular container so if your machine reboots there wasn't uh, well that's the question i mean it's probably for you to test whether that comes up with that um because i'm not sure whether docker then stops all containers when it's a proper shutdown um but by default sort of like they don't get automatic the restore uh, started um i mean the other yeah. way you can always to use the always flag, so regardless of whether it got stopped or not, can be a bit annoying, I think, if you're trying to stop something and it keeps coming back from the dead like a zombie, um, especially if it doesn't work. But um, give it the unless stopped flag, maybe a go, and test whether you reboot your laptop, for instance, and whether those services are still running, or if you have a server, whether you can run it with that. This is why I test it within a Docker container. <laughs> <laughs> well, you probably have a test virtual environment. I mean, you can just yeah. use a virtual machine where you can run thing. that, where you actually, you have your outside um, development environment and then you have a virtual machine where you should test that then. And you could easily enough try that then. I was just thinking restarting a Docker container would be quicker than a full VM. Room. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and I think in the old days there was actually a separate command. But looking at the screen now, I, I I gained the impression that when you first start running the Docker container, you could put in this um, extra command to always restart. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's good because um, yeah. it, when it first happens to you and you think, why isn't the container going? Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I didn't hear that question. Um, I, I didn't actually start saying. I, I just I thought I'd give you a chance to talk to finish. Sorry. Yes. 
Very nice of you. Thank you. Uh, can I ask another question? Yep. Sure. Um, if you put your Python hat on as well, if somebody is running a very small computer from home, say, is there a system where you could be running a container in the cloud somewhere, um, you know, AWS or a Catalyst Cloud, wherever, and uh, it will do your um, uh, Python Pi tests and and all those sorts of things as as part of your development effort. It will do them in the cloud as opposed to doing it on your little machine at home. Have you come across that? SSH into your yeah, I mean, it's just a virtual machine that you run in AWS, right? So it's just another Linux box. Um, is that, are you trying to sort of like automatically build things if things change and push out new images or? No, I was literally thinking of uh, developing a, a function here and a function there, and then running running your um, pie tests on each function as you go. Um, so the system would be built in the container in the cloud, rather than, as I say, on a perhaps a very small machine at home. Right. I mean, you, you can use AWS Cloud9, I'm not sure that it's as good now that AWS have taken it over, but there you go. Um, that, that's that an the, entire yeah. IDE and Python yes, system yeah. all rolled into one. Um, but it's behind the times. It's not up to... Right. Um, I don't even think they're running 3.9, leave alone 10 and now 11. Right. Um, I mean, if you treat the AWS instance just like another machine, then you could just run things there. So, I mean, it's at the end of the day, you can just have a, a build script that then does a git pull of your repos and whatnot, and then calls whatever PyTests and whatnot are necessary, for instance. And it doesn't have to run on your local machine while you continue developing, especially if it's long running tests. Yeah, just do everything, all communication by SSH. Yeah, I mean, um, are you using AWS in, virtual, uh, like instances to SSH into? Uh, no, I'm not doing any of this. It just occurred to me while you were talking. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, I mean, yes, you're, you're right. I mean, we, we do that sort of thing with a VPS all the time. So yeah, yeah it must be possible. And I have yeah. a feeling that PyCharm has some sort of a facility. I just haven't looked at it. Um, yeah. Whether it goes to a Docker container or whether it goes to something that JetBrains run, I, I have no idea. As I say, I haven't looked at it. Yeah, I mean, with Docker, yeah, for, I mean, you could have a Docker image that contains the instructions for pulling, testing, and whatnot. Um, and you would then sort of like um, build, build that script basically in the cloud and that contains everything that you want to do. So in some sense, a fancy like bash script, because um, I mean, that's, that's one way of doing it possibly. Well, whether that's the best one or you just have a shell script. I mean, it depends on whether this happens for different clients or not, uh, whether these things will be different or whether you build or run things separately. But um, with, Docker, at least, you could set up your build environment specifically for a particular test each time, and that just gets thrown away. And you, I'm not sure, you could probably just spin up a um, Docker image in the cloud itself, so it might not have to be actually um, a Linux instance of a particular type. So you could just probably point to a Docker image and then execute that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I was thinking of, I mean, with, with say a VPS, as Lawrence says, you can SSH into it. Yeah. You can do what you like. So if you had a, a Python development environment 
you were running VI or something, and um, away you go. Um, I, I was wondering if you could do something similar using Docker as opposed to a full bore um, virtual private server. So that, that's all right. Just an idle question. I thought maybe you had thought about such things, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I have a separate build server for my images, um, but it doesn't do anything else apart from build, uh, sort of like pulling sort of like um, from a Git repo, building the image and pushing that out to various registries. So that's basically all it does. Um, it doesn't do any fancy things uh, with like then running tests after that or whatnot. And don't forget, you can do hot file transfers via rsync with SSH. So, you know, you've got your working repo on your own machine, and then you rsync the updates to the, to the, uh, yeah. to the virtual machine, and then yes. run those scripts. So there. rather than actually doing a commit and the pull on the other end, you could just whatever is currently on your machine, rsync that over there, and then run some tests there. Yeah. That's what I do, because I like to test before I commit. Yeah. yeah. Or, or alternatively, have nothing on your local machine, and the source that you're developing you is, is on the uh, is inside the container in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I think I think a container is disposable. Yeah. Um, so all my important stuff. Is not the thing yeah. is, yeah, yeah that, that's a, that's a serious risk, um, Lawrence. Yeah. Yeah, the thing is that um, with Docker, if you're having to deal with um, IDEs and whatnot, then you actually have to map ports for your um, like X11 and things like that. That just gets annoying. So if it's command line based, yeah, not so much of a problem. But as soon as there's um, other things involved, it can get a little bit twiddly um, getting all the ports sorted. And then um, especially with X11, there's also a bit of tricky things with um, X hosts and whatnot and all these things that you need to fiddle with. You can, but... Um, Again, all the IPs in time, all that could be SSH. Yeah, but in order to get the user interface out of the Docker container, you actually need to map ports already. Yeah, because the, by Docker, default, the Docker get... container would have to be running X terminal. Yes. Yeah. But I mean, if you have your IDE, graphical IDE in the Docker container, then whatever, if you're running X11, that needs to be mapped outside so that you can connect to that as well in order to see that. So it's like, personally, probably not worth, not worth it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, a sidetrack. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Yep, cool. All right. Uh, Lawrence. V-Server. There is no current DBM package called V-Server anymore. All right. I, I don't think it's been used for anything. OK. OK. So I think, yeah, I think Maybe I was wrong then. VPSs yep. are proper virtualization. OK. When you at a yeah. Company. I think it's all full on virtual. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I'll take that back then. Um, it's maybe it's just still only a legacy system that you can build if you want to use that. And I guess maybe it was because all the Hyper V's and all that sort of like came later on that it was. V server was before. Yes. I think they call it para virtualization. Yes. The hardware didn't support it. Yeah. But you could build a custom Linux kernel. Mm. That you know, so because the kernel mm. did its own protection anyway, mm. you know, and uh, so it knew there was another real kernel and that extra hardware and all that. Mm. So, but, but because it stood in the way, the user processes could never see that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah that was before full virtualization. Yeah. yeah. So it's probably nowadays cheap enough doing full virtualization. Back when things like Sony laptops would use virtualization capable chips. Yes. But in the BIOS, they would disable it unless you paid extra <laughs> for the next model. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. In that case, thanks for joining.